This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. All right, so you want to learn how to master manual exposure on film photography. First and foremost, that is something that everyone needs to do, whether you are a beginner in film photography or maybe you're just someone who has been dependent on using your camera's light meter. But knowing how to properly expose your film without any light meter at all is a very powerful tool to have when you don't have a light meter available or just when you're on the go and on the fly and you need to set your exposure. Now folks, today we're gonna to be talking about how you can master your own manual exposure in three simple steps. But I guarantee you, if you make it to the end of this video, you will be on your way to mastering manual exposure. <laughs> All right, you guys, what's going on, man? Welcome back to yet another King James video. Now, what I need you to do before we start, folks, is to grab a piece of paper or even just open up the notes app on your phone. Also, grab your camera because we are going to be using your camera as a reference tool. So grab those and come right back. All right, you guys, so just imagine having the power to read light just by looking at it. Folks, the goal of this video is to kind of get you guys on track to be able to look at a scene, whether it's dark, whether it's super sunny, and know exactly what your settings are before you even touch your camera. Now folks, it seems complicated, it almost seems like it's a superpower because in a way it kinda is, uh, but it's something that everybody can learn and along with some practice and just some you know, quality time with your camera, you can get to that point where you can just read light just by looking at it. Now the first step folks in the three step process here is to know the variables. Now what am I talking about folks? When you're talking about exposure, there are three different variables that you need to consider. The first one you guys is your film ISO. Now because we are shooting film, your ISO isn't going to change. It's not one of the variables that you can adjust. Of course, on digital cameras, you can adjust and change your ISO as much as you want, but because we are talking about film photography, folks, when you look at a roll of film, there's going to be a value on the very front. So for example, this roll of film is rated at 200 ISO. So that is the first variable, folks, ISO. And you gotta know that your film ISO is never going to change. You set it and you forget about it. So now that we got the first variable out of the way, let's talk about the two variables that do actually change. The first one, folks, is your aperture. Now what the aperture controls is the amount of light that your lens diaphragm lets in. Now, the reason why this is very important is because you can control the amount of light that goes in based off of the aperture value that you select. So if you have a larger aperture, like 1.4 or 1.8, your lens is going to be pretty much open and you're going to allow a lot of light onto that film. And when you stop your lens down to a smaller number, it's going to let less light in. Now the second variable that can change is your shutter speed. Now your shutter speed is always going to be on a shutter dial of some sort. I don't know if you guys can see that here, but on the F3 it has values from bulb all the way up to one two thousandths of a second. Now what your shutter speed does is it controls the speed in which your shutter opens up to let light in. And based on what shutter speed you have, it can be really slow, like for a one second shutter speed, or it can be really fast at like a one five hundredths of a second shutter speed. Now some of you may have noticed the similarity between aperture and shutter speed. They both control the same thing, the amount of light that is let in based off of the value that you choose. But there is a huge difference, folks because each of these variables are going to control a different effect on your photo. So for example, with your aperture ring, because it is inside of your lens, your aperture is going to control the depth of field. If you choose a larger aperture like 1.4, you're going to get more shallow depth of field, which means there's less of a range that your lens is going to be in focus. What this results in, folks, is with a larger aperture, you will see a lot of out of focus backgrounds, what we call bokeh, and that in itself can give you some really nice creative effects. On the other end of the spectrum, when you stop your lens down to like f8, f16, it's going to give you a really deep depth of field, which in trade makes a lot of the range that you have in focus, which is going to be kind of like what you would see in street photography, corner to corner sharpness between, you know, three to 10 feet. On the other hand, shutter speed is going to control motion blur. So if you're shooting photographs with moving subjects in the frame, you're going to want to use a fast shutter speed to freeze the action. 
Now, what happens when you have a very, very slow shutter speed and you're photographing things that are moving? Folks, you're going to get something called motion blur. And so you always want to keep that into consideration, you know, what shutter speed you're going to be shooting at, you know, what are your subjects doing in the frame? If they're fast moving subjects, that shutter speed needs to be really fast. But if you're doing something that requires you to open that shutter for a longer period of time and everything is kind of still like doing a long exposure, maybe like star shot, you're going to use a slower shutter speed, of course. Now, even though the aperture and shutter speed have two completely different creative effects, they still both control the exact same thing, the amount of light that you let in onto that film. Okay, so that was a lot of information to take in. You know, you have your aperture, you have your shutter speed, and you also have that ISO. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about what each of the variables are and what they do in terms of the relation into your image, uh, we're going to be talking now about how to actually read light. And folks, it's very simple, and it really all boils down to using this technique called Sunny 16. Now, I made a video in the past that I'm going to use as a reference, and I'm gonna leave a card up here for you guys to check it out. But Sunny 16, folks, is a great way to learn manual exposure, and it's going to give you that freedom to really know and learn how to read light. Now, before I do a recap on what Sunny 16 is and offer up some of my tips on how I learned exposure, I wanna give a huge thank you and shout out to our sponsor for this episode, the good folks over at Squarespace. Squarespace is your all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. One of the best ways to set yourself apart as a photographer is to create your own portfolio and dedicated website apart from all of the other social media that you already have. Squarespace offers a ton of different award-winning templates that you guys can use to get up and running in minutes. They also give you options for a blog, an e-commerce store, and probably my new favorite feature, the video feature. Having a dedicated page for just video content, whether you are a YouTuber or just a videographer, allows you to share that content a lot more easily in your own personal space. So if you guys wanna get started with your own dedicated website, head over to squarespace.com slash kingjapes and enter promo code kingjapes at checkout. You guys can get 10% off of your first purchase of a domain or a website. Huge thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now what Sunny 16 is folks, is a way for you to closely relate a specific aperture to what the weather looks like outside, or not weather, maybe I should say what the light looks like outside. So if it is sunny outside, your aperture is gonna remain at F16. Leave it at that sunny outside aperture F16. Now let's say it's sunny with a couple of clouds in the sky. Uh, but for the most part, you know, there still is a lot of sun out there. You're going to go ahead and drop that over to F11. Now, let's say outside it's mostly cloudy, but the sun is still peeking through here and there. It's not overcast. Folks, that is going to be F8. F5.6, I would consider overcast. And F4 and F... Oh, that's my rice cooker. And F4 and F2.8, I would consider shade under a tree or anything of that sort. Once you can recognize the available light, closely associate that best to this little chart, and that is going to be your aperture. So now that your aperture is set and you have that variable out of the way, the next thing we need to look at is the ISO that you're shooting. Now let's say you are shooting 400 ISO film. Now using the Sunny 16 method, you're going to set your shutter speed in relation to the ISO that you're shooting. So for example, if you're shooting a 400 ISO film, the closest shutter speed that I have to that is 1 500th of a second. Let's say I am shooting a 200 ISO film. The closest shutter speed that I have for that is 1 250th of a second. Now, once you set that shutter speed in relation to your ISO, and then you also figure out the aperture that you need to shoot at based on the light that's available outside, you can now go out there without a light meter and shoot and your exposure will be very, very close to accurate every single time, if not 100% spot on. You guys, Sunny 16 is a formula that you can use to get perfect exposure every single time. Only comes with practice though, because you need to look at Sunny 16 like it is a scale. Now, I'm not gonna go super in depth with Sunny 16. If you guys want to see a little bit more of a detailed explanation and as well as how you can kind of, you know, adjust the different variables to achieve the same result just with different inputs, I need you guys to check out this video um, because I made this one a couple years back and it's just a lot more detailed than what I can offer you in this episode. So once you check that out folks, come back here because now I'm gonna be talking about a couple of Sunny 16 tips before we move on to the third step. 
Okay, so now in terms of how I utilize Sunny 16 to master my manual exposure, the first thing that I would do is to only use Sunny 16 for the next week or so. Uh, and what I want you guys to do is just try to, you know, look at the scene outside for seven days, figure out what your exposure light is, just take one photograph, and then double check your progress with a light meter. So let's say I think this scene outside is, you know, overcast, it's 5.6 and I'm shooting 500 ISO, or excuse me, 400 ISO film. I'm gonna say my setting is 5.6 at one five hundredths of a second. The next thing that I would do is I would take a light meter, whether that be a light meter from your phone's app store or a physical light meter, go ahead and just double check that. And once you double check, you can kind of cross reference, you know, if you were right or not. And do this consistently, you know, practice, go into different rooms, go into, you know, random locations and just try to guess your exposure because there is a power in guessing uh, and eventually it turns into, you know, being able to recognize these scenes and know exactly what you need to get good exposure. So, you know, a lot of times I'll just be out and about shooting and I won't even, you know, pull my camera to my face. I'll look at a scene and I'll say, okay, that is F8 at one two fiftieths of a second. Boom, I'll take my light meter out. I'll take a reading and one, okay, perfect. F8, one two fiftieths of a second. I know my exposure. You guys, it's a very simple kind of just, you know, way to learn manual exposure using Sunny 16. As time progresses, you're going to get better and better and better up to the point where you don't even need a cross reference and you can have that confidence to know uh, your own exposure. And the last and final tip that I have for you guys is just to continuously practice and make sure that you guys are shooting on full manual mode. Now, you know, light meters and program modes, aperture priority, these are all great things. They're there to be convenient and offer you some extra help in case you don't know your exposure. But if you really, really want to master manual exposure, folks, you're going to need to try to shoot in manual mode most of the time. Using that light meter is fine. You know, if you really don't want to miss a shot, you can go back into that program or aperture priority mode. But if you really want to, you know, just get good at using your own eyes, and figuring out that exposure by yourself, you're gonna need to shoot in manual mode. And if you fail, if you make bad exposures, that's fine. You know, that is to be expected. It took me a really long time to get even just remotely good at reading exposure. You're going to have roles where they're not that great. You're gonna have great roles. You're gonna have, you know, 50-50 roles. But at the end of the day, folks, regardless of how much film you shoot that may be bad, you're going to need that practice and you're only going to be able to get better if you fail once or twice. A great way to keep track of this is to use a notebook or like a photo memo book from Shoot Film Co. You know, write down the settings from each of your shot, why you thought it was this exposure, and then, you know, compare your results after you get the film developed. But if you stay consistent and if you continuously shoot on manual mode, you're going to be well on your way, folks, to mastering manual exposure. So that is going to wrap up this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment down below if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, or even just advice for other photographers, maybe something that helped you learn manual exposure. But that's it from you guys. I'll see you in the next one. I hope this video was helpful. As always, Renault to gang.